So Neil Gaiman is my favorite author. Genre. If you are in a reading slump, if you are in a writing slump, if you are in a life slump, pick up View from the Cheap Seats. So Neil Gaiman is my favorite author. I don't have occasion to talk about him that much on my channel just because he doesn't have like a ton of new releases, so I'm not constantly reading new books from him and reviewing books from him. But he is my favorite author, which I may or may not have mentioned on this channel, so you may or may not be aware. And there are still a couple Neil Gaiman books that I have not read. One of which I put off reading because I figured I figured it would be good, but I didn't think, you know, it, it didn't excite me that much the idea of reading it. I was like, I'll get to it one of these days. Plus, the aggregate rating on Goodreads is like on the lower end, and this is Neil Gaiman and he's pretty well loved, so for a book not to be that highly rated, I was like, it'll be, it'll be fine, it'll probably have some good moments and, and just like not be one of my favorites. And I am so mad at myself for putting off reading it because The View from the Cheap Seats by Neil Gaiman is now among my favorite Neil Gaiman books, and he's my favorite author. So. My, my official favorite Neil Gaiman books up to this point were and are Ocean at the End of the Lane and The Graveyard Book. Not to say his other books aren't great too, but those have been my favorites. And now I'll have to say I have three favorite Neil Gaiman books. Those two and The View from the Cheap Seats. The View from the Cheap Seats is selected nonfiction. Again, one of the reasons I was like, I'm sure it's good, but like, you know. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. As with not all, but m most, I would say, Neil Gaiman books, the audiobook is written by Neil Gaiman himself. And since many of the things that are in this collection of nonfiction are speeches that he gave, like commencement speeches or award speeches or things like that, um, not everything in here is a speech, but a lot of it is. Um, so him reading that in the audiobook kind of feels like, you know, what it would have been like to hear that speech being given. Plus, it's conversational because then he also kind of talks about like, so like when I gave this speech, I said X, Y, and Z. Or like when I gave this speech, I originally would have, you know, said X, Y, Z here, but like not any, not not here anymore. I don't remember what I said or kind of went off script there. So he's like kind of talking to you anyway in the book. So having Neil Gaiman talk to you in the audiobook feels like the right way to experience this. I mean, Guillermo del Toro put it better than I probably could. So like, I'll just read this and then, you know, the video will be over. Like having Neil Gaiman all to yourself for a long, witty, unforgettable trip, an intimate, erudite, and illuminating conversation with one of the great minds of fantasy, a dream come true. Yes, that is how I feel. Now I will warn you, if you have too many books on your TBR, then don't read The View from the Cheap Seats. Not because this is adding one more book to your TBR, but because reading this will make you put about 50 books on your TBR. Because again, a lot of the things that are in this um, collection are introductions that he's given for anniversary editions of books, or articles he's written about other authors, or interviews, uh, things like that that he's done, where he's talking about other authors. And the way that he talks about his favorite authors makes you want to read them. It makes you want to drop everything. Well, not this. You definitely want to keep reading this. You never want to drop this. But it makes you want to drop everything else that you have and read all the things that Neil Gaiman is gushing about. Uh, some that come to mind that he talks about at great length. He talks a lot about Diana Wynne Jones. He talks about Stephen King. He talks about Gene Wolfe because I believe he was quite close friends with Gene Wolfe. Uh, or at least professionally, like uh, they were quite close. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not best best friends, but like he had a good relationship with Gene Wolfe. Terry Pratchett, obviously, with whom he co-wrote Good Omens. He talks about Ray Bradbury quite a bit and, you know, and more. Oh, and uh, he talks actually quite a bit about um, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, whose name currently escapes me. Hang on a second. Douglas Adams. <laughs> While I was flipping, I was also reminded that he talks a lot about C.S. Lewis. So anyway, um, it will make you want to pick up all of those authors, just because the way Neil Gaiman talks about them makes you want to read it. And it's partly because I always want to read Neil, like part of what the joy of reading Neil Gaiman is the way that he has with words. So he could convince me to read, I mean, I'm sure he could convince me to read books that I think are terrible because, I mean, if he enjoyed them, uh, because the way that he talks about it, it just, you want to feel what he's feeling. You want to experience what he's talking about experiencing. And the way that he writes in general, I mean, when he, uh, some of these, uh, like there's a famous commencement speech that he gave that has been published separately. It's also in this collection, but it was published separately and illustrated separately. And it's called um, Make Good Art or Art Matters. I think it's called Make Good Art. Yeah, it's called Make Good Art. And it's an amazing speech. You can see why it was separately published. But I will tell you that like from the very beginning, I was like probably like on the third you know, piece of selected nonfiction when I was like on the verge of tears. And they're not like, <laughs> it's not like it's like a Robin Hobb book. I'm not saying it's like ultimate tragedy, but there's a poignancy to Neil Gaiman's writing that like it, this book brought me to tears multiple times. Um, and I wasn't, you know, like 
horrible waterworks. But like, you know, choking up, misty-eyed, because he's talking about something in a way that just hits. And the way Neil Gaiman writes, I've said this in my Discord to my patrons, and I said it to a couple other people, and I've said similar things about him all the time, is just that he's so, so humble, and so, and I, I guess that, that sounds really like, you know, saintly. Like, he's not saintly, but like, he's quite self-deprecating and quite down to earth when you see it. That's why it's such a joy to see him in interviews and speeches, because he doesn't act like he is the legend that he is. I mean, if anyone could get away with acting like a legend, it's Neil Gaiman because he is a legend, but he doesn't, which is what makes him so charming. So he kind of, he is very nonchalant about what he does and he's saying things constantly like, you know, people pay me to make up stories. Like, I don't know why, but like, I'm really glad that they do because I love making up stories. Um, he doesn't act like, you know, I am a gift to literature. You are welcome. Like, he's like, I like to write stuff and luckily I have found the opportunity to get paid for that. So he's quite down to earth and makes fun of himself a lot. But at the same time, weirdly, he talks about literature and writing and fantasy fiction as like this great and noble thing that should be respected and should be preserved and should be paid attention to. So he talks about his own work like it's kind of a joke, but he talks about the type of work that he does like it's the most important thing in the world. And... <sighs> You can't help, especially as a sci-fi fantasy reader, which you probably are if you're reading a selection of nonfiction from Neil Gaiman, you too feel this way about SFF and you also have experienced the world kind of deriding SFF. And the way that he talks about genre, the way he talks about his own conceptualization of genre, what is genre? I feel the need to talk like Alan for a second, genre. But the way he talks is sort of like, because he gets asked questions like this all the time. What is it that makes great SFF great? And he'll be like, what is it that makes SFF? What does that even mean? What are the lines? What are the rules? Are there rules? Is it when you have no rules that becomes SFF? Like he's like constantly kind of like working through those questions because he hasn't really, he doesn't put things in boxes. His publishers do. And that too about, like I've often said that he writes for children as if they are adults and he writes for adults as if they are children, which is another amazing thing about his books, which is why middle grade to adult, I'll read anything that he writes for that reason. So when he again, like gets asked questions, like, you know, so how do you set up, like when you decide to write something, how do you decide that this is gonna be middle grade or this is gonna be adult? And he's like, I don't, I just write a story. And then other people are like, this is middle grade or like this is adult. I mean, something I'm sure he never envisioned thought of American Gods as, you know, being for kids, but he just kind of writes stories and then they kind of just like make their way towards whatever age group they're most appropriate for, um, which is an amazing way to think of things. And like, he, like many authors will say, you know, write what you want to read, but he applies that to children as well. He writes what he would have wanted to read as a child. And as a child, he wasn't really reading kids books because you know, it's more of a modern phenomenon that you have such like age segmented um, book publishing that you have, you know, clear delineations of like, this is a children's book. This is like a, a middle grade book. This is a young adult book. This is an adult book. Like now we have new adult, like there weren't so many divisions. Um, so he was just reading whatever was in the library. And he has a funny story that he tells in a couple different speeches in this collection where I think his daughter was like reading Goosebumps. And he was like, oh, if you like Goosebumps, you'll love this. And he gave her Carrie by Stephen King and it utterly traumatized her. He was like, so I don't, I don't recommend doing that. But that's kind of his thought process when he's writing for kids and clearly when he's giving his kids books to read. Like he doesn't really like have like, oh, this is a kid's book. This is an adult book. He's just like, this is just a book. This is just a story. And if you like one creepy story, you'll like another creepy story. And he has a story about Coraline where um, he didn't think it was too dark, but um, I think it was his editor or his publisher or somebody like that who told him this is great, but this is way too scary. You can't publish this for kids. And he was like, I'll make you a deal. Read it to your kid, to your daughter. I think it was a, I think it was a girl. Read it to your kid. And if she doesn't like it or if she thinks it's too scary, then you know, then I'll, I'll concede. And then, you know, she reads it to the kid and the kid loves it. So of course it gets published as, um, as a middle grade um, book. And then years later, he talked to the, the kid who was now an adult and she was like, oh, I was super scared. But like, I couldn't admit that because then I knew that I wouldn't be allowed to finish it or to read it. So like that she like pretended not to be scared because she wanted to read it, which is again, kind of what Neil Gaiman gets about kids. Like, no, I'm not saying every kid likes scary stories. Not all of them do. Not every book that he writes for kids is scary. Like, Fortunately the Milk is not scary. And again, with Fortunately the Milk, he was asked, you know, like, you were like told, or like, it was brought to his attention that like, it isn't a good idea to write a middle grade book where the protagonist is the father, as opposed to one of the kids. And he's just like, whatever. <laughs> he just 
just writes what he writes. And that's the thing, like this idea that you kind of have to like, there are rules to like what this has to be in order to fit a certain slot. You know, it's, it's not that clear cut. Like, you know, kids, what did you want to read when you were a kid? It probably wasn't something super clean and tidy and polished and nice and simple. Like you wanted to like read interesting, juicy, adventurous, possibly scary things. And that's how Neil Gaiman writes. He writes because he still wants those things in, as an adult. So he still writes those things for adults, but he also writes them for kids because that's what he wanted when he was a kid and he still does. But yeah, the way that he talks about his favorite authors, the way that he talks about authors that were friends of his, about kind of the behind the scenes look of what they are like. Um, and they all seem like amazing people when he talks about them. You kind of get this glimpse into what they're like as, as people as well. And they all kind of seem, at least to the lens of Neil Gaiman, like also really chill, nice, interesting pretty down to earth individuals. It makes sense that they you know that's why he would be friends with them because you know you gravitate towards people that are like you. So I feel like Neil Gaiman wouldn't be likely to be super tight friends with somebody that was the opposite of him in that sense, that was like super egotistical. I don't see him gelling with a personality like that. So it was lovely hearing him talk about uh, Douglas Adams and what he's like as a person, Stephen King, what he's like as a person, Gene Wolfe, what he's like as a person, and just like different philosophies of the approach to writing. Um, and I feel like, you know, the idea of hearing about writing craft from, you know, the legends that is Neil Gaiman would be intimidating. The idea that like, oh, I could never write that good. I could never write anything as amazing as that. But there's no one that's ever made me feel more confident and more hopeful and more comfortable with the idea of writing than Neil Gaiman because he's very, you know, low key about it himself and the advice he gives is amazing advice because it's not like it's not some like lofty crazy advice he's like look you're gonna want to imitate the people that you love and that's fine like that's how you learn you're gonna want to imitate their styles I've done it too but only you can write like you so in terms of what is unique about what you're offering to the world is the fact that only you have your voice only you have your story idea so that's what will set you apart that's what makes your writing you uh, that's what makes you different. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about being unique because only you can write what you can write. You're, you're already there, which is, I mean, it's true and it's, it's fantastic. And then part two is that, you know, if you worry about writing something that you think other people will want, if you worry about writing something that you think will be popular, then if it doesn't end up being popular, it doesn't end up being well received or picked up, then it's just a waste of your time and a disappointment, or at least you'll feel that it was a waste of your time and you'll just be disappointed and there's no upside to that. But if you just write what you would want to read. If you write a story that you love, that you love writing it and you love reading it, then, you know, in a perfect world that does get picked up and it gets, you know, loved and it gets read and that's great. But if it doesn't, you still have that story that you love, that you loved writing and that you would still love to read. So write what you would love and you will come out a winner either way, which is again, great advice that people lose sight of. So yeah, basically I'm saying if you are in a reading slump, pick up View from the Cheap Seats. If you are in a writing slump, pick up View from the Cheap Seats. If you are in a life slump, pick up View from the Cheap Seats. Because this book is just the absolute best pick-me-up that you could ask for. And um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about if this book, if you've read it, or about Neil Gaiman in general. I will, I'm always happy to talk about Neil Gaiman. As I said, he is my favorite author. And the part of the reason that I picked this up is because I am getting to see him again, because uh, he's touring again. Um, he hasn't, you know, he did it before, I think the last, when I saw him the first and last time was like five years ago now, um, when he was touring. So now that the pandemic has calmed down, he's touring again. So I'm very, very excited to be seeing him again. And I thought, ah, well, you know, I have a couple gaming books that I haven't read yet ever. So now's a good time. And I'm so glad that I did. It put me in the exact, like, excited mood that I needed to be in to be hyped. I mean, not that I wasn't already hyped, but to be hyped to see Neil Gaiman. So anyway, let me know your thoughts and feelings about Gaiman, the man, the legend. Whatever you let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays so I can subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.